Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Next Level Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Leslie. Woohoo! What an amazing relationship mini series I had to kick off season three. Holy cow, did I learn a lot, and I'm sure all of you did too. We talked about so many amazing things, and my mind is blown. I feel like a relationship expert now. I went into this totally dumb, like not knowing anything about dating in this climate, in this day and age, and all the crazy complexities, the open relationships, the closed relationships, the polyamory, the spiritual aspects, the divorce, the getting together, the dating strategies. Whoa, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Are you exhausted thinking about it, Jay? I am. Yeah, he is. <laughs> so today we're just doing an in-office with Dr. Leslie to do a recap on the relationship series, talking a little bit about the guests that I had on, some of the highlights, so you guys can kind of, um, you know, get a little, get, get the little nuggets out of what we wanted to sort of get out of this whole series. So Again, when I went into this, having broken up with someone that was very special and important to me, and I didn't enjoy the process of falling in love and then feeling like they had, you know, serious intimacy issues, and I'd never experienced that before, and it really hurt, and I, I felt like I did something wrong, and I didn't understand, and it was really painful for me to, to overcome because I took so much responsibility when I shouldn't have. And of course, me being me and bubbly and wanting to learn, I wanted to make sure that I could heal and navigate relationships going forward in the best way, because that's just what I do. That's what my doctor at nursing practice is all about. It's looking at the literature, talking to the experts, diving in, and then applying it in a way that's going to be its best, uh, most innovative, very practical, efficient, effective. So we kind of dissected as best we could the relationship arena so we could all finally have the types of relationships that we hope for and strive for. So the first guest I had on my show was Natalia, a little spitfire Latina. Oh my gosh, a relationship coach, a therapist turned relationship coach. It's very interesting chatting with her because she had a very traditional perspective of dating so she helps women to find their person to marry, like very traditional, old school, in the box kind of thinking, right? We we want to be kind of like settled down. And this is primarily for women who still want to have the kids that, you know, they've been very successful, they're, you know, ambitious, but they still want to have that, you know, traditional white picket fence with the kids type of dynamic. Not really what I was going for, because I've been there, done that, have the t-shirt and the tramp stamp. Kidding, I don't, <laughs> with my ex's face on it, right? Could you imagine? No. Um, but, you know, it was, it was interesting to get her perspective for those of my listeners out there that really wanted to find their person and, and they haven't had their person for the first time. So it was, it was fascinating. She did, we did talk a lot off air. And we discussed some of the challenges that I was having. And <clears throat> I appreciated that she had suggested that women who are powerful and or empowered, they need to connect with their feminine side. So those of us women who are very progressive and really balancing our feminine and masculine side, sometimes we forget how to be feminine with men. It's actually never really been a problem for me because I genu genuinely love being feminine. Even when I'm powerhousing, I still do it in a very feminine way. I feel balanced pretty much all the time. But it was really interesting that she had mentioned that it's a really big hiccup, that there are simple things that women do when they're out with men that are very masculine energy. And we want to avoid being masculine because then that's when we're going to just get the fuck buddies right? Which, if that's what you're after, amen, sister, right? I mean, I have no judgment, been there as well, where I've just wanted to, you know, have someone to engage with, to meet my needs, and that's really it. Like, wham, bam, thank you, sir. That doesn't rhyme, but you get it. So we got to find something else. What, 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 Jay? You got to think about it, this podcast, to, to supplement that. Um, so we... 
we, I, you know, I really appreciated her perspective. I loved the whole femininity. I loved, you know, her coaching us to be more balanced. And some of those simple things are just allowing the guy to, you know, pull the chair out for you. For the women that are very fem feminist, I guess, may not want that. Um, but those are some simple things, letting him open the door for you, helping you with your things. Um, allowing him to sort of give to you is the premise of what she was saying. Women should kind of receive and allow to be given to because the guy wants to show you that he can provide and protect and those types of things. So that was a very the, one of the big points that I wanted to bring up for those women who haven't had their first long-term relationship and they're really wanting to find someone, make sure that you're staying in your feminine energy. Even if you're an ambitious badass, practice that. And you can always reach out to Natalia if you need some relationship coaching. She has a really amazing program to um, subscribe to and she works one-on-one -on -one with you. It's like a three-month thing. The only thing that I did not really necessarily agree with and it wasn't like a full out disagreement, but one of the things, again, when we talked off camera, she was saying, I would not support any one of my clients if they were sleeping with three people at once, flat out. Just like, nope, that's not part of my strategy. And her reasoning too was, well, I shouldn't say her reasoning. She does not want women to engage in sex right away, at least a month wait. And there has to have a conversation that she said to have with the guy saying, okay, we're going to have sex. Um, what does sex mean to you? So we're on the same page. Because she said, and this is true, we, we talked about this, biologically, women, we get emotionally attached. We secrete much more oxytocin after we have sex, particularly after an orgasm, and we bond. Like, boom! You know, and so women have to actively, like, break that chemical reaction and like mindset themselves out of it because it is a very powerful chemical that runs through our our body men get it as well but at a much lesser degree so loved that she wanted to have the talk she was being very structured about intimacy and you know I wasn't so sure that I would necessarily agree with not having sex with the people that you're dating. So if you're dating two guys or three, I th three is a lot, I think, sometimes, to not have sex with any of them. I kind of did disagree because sex is a, an important piece to me knowing my compatibility with someone. I'm also older and more mature and been down that road quite a bit. You know, I was married for forever and dated that I know how to kind of separate that and understand my biology and know how to manage my, emo my emotions when they run off for the most part. So, you know, I get her perspective. Uh, for someone that's a little bit older, she might be coaching. Maybe that wouldn't necessarily be as big of, you know, a concern. Also, when you get to my age and with all the regenerative um, approach that I take with carnivore and my anti-aging supplementation and intermittent fasting and on and on and on the things I do, my sex drive is redonkulous. Um, I totally feel what you 20-year-old and 30-year-old men feel like. Everything is phallic. <laughs> this is phallic. That is phallic. That's phallic. It's like I see dicks everywhere. <laughs> so um, for me, that strategy would not necessarily work also because I value intimacy. I value sex. I know the importance of it in a relationship. When I was married for 14 years, we had sex even near the end, those last 18 months when he was, you know, we were falling apart. We still had sex twice a week. Like I could not not, not have sex and I almost hated his guts basically by the end, but it's still an important part of bonding and connection. But I'm also a little bit more liberal. I'm in the sense that I love pleasure, I love the intimacy, I love the connection, and so that's an important piece for me to know someone. I don't want to be waiting a month dating somebody and investing all this time and then not, you know, know if he, we're compatible in bed. Like, that's actually probably more problematic. Um, but again, my dating is a little bit you know, I date, date, date. I'll go on several dates with a guy at the beginning and then I read them out fast. So it's kind of, you know, my strategy is a little bit different. Anyways, 
great. Love Natalia. Get into her program if you need a little bit of guidance for those of you young gals who are ready to settle down and get the babies going and the diamond rings. Then we had Jamie Lynn. She is such an amazing woman. I literally felt like she was my soulmate. <laughs> She's beautiful, hot, smart, totally progressive, but, you know, um, traditional in some respects too. She has a podcast, The Pink Bell, that actually is shot here in Sticky Paw Studio. And we talked about empowering women and some of this misogynist bullshit that's happening with, I think it was called the Red Pill thing that's going on where men, women are an abomination if they are over the age of 25 and had more than, you know, a couple of sex partners or whatever, like stupid stuff. Um, just really, I don't think it's evolving at all. I think that's like a de-evolutionary concept personally. But um, we, you know, it was fascinating because I really, I prejudged thinking that she was going to be a little bit more progressive in the sense of polyamory and thinking that open relationships work and that sort of thing. And she did not. She found from her experience that they're very challenging types of relationships. Very, very few of them actually are sustainable because one person tends to be jealous, one tends to bond a little bit more. And that was very interesting because I know nothing about it. And I was really fascinated to learn more about these concepts. Now, I did ask, as a side note, I put posts out everywhere looking for couples that had open relationships and were polyamorous and all the things, and no one responded. It was crickets. Crickets. No one wanted to go on air publicly <laughs> and video be videoed that they have an open relationship, which was too bad because it would have been really great to hear a little bit from the horse's mouth. But the... Uh, Jamie Lynn, who's the therapist, was able to share a little bit from her perspective, and she said that they tend to be a little bit more challenging, definitely not long-term. They tend to be, you know, a little toxic at times, and someone always ends up getting hurt or feel or feels like they're not getting what they want out of the relationship fully. So the suggestion there is to maybe not get into that. She also, I, I believe it was Jamie Lynn had mentioned that when you have those types of relationships, when you're willing to share your man, you're either very, very insecure and you're doing it because you just want to please him and keep him, or you are, um, what was the other thing she said? Or, hmm, gosh, I can't remember. It'll come to me. But basically, it comes from a place that's not in the most healthy, it's not respected you're not respecting necessarily yourself. So again, anyone who's out there listening, don't take that as the gospel. That was just a perspective and some insights. If you have a relationship that is open and you have a different perspective, well then just DM me and we'll get your ass on the show and you can prove all of the therapists wrong, okay? Um, okay, so next one is Mandy McKellar. Oh my God, she was super fun too. A uh, divorce attorney here in town in Las Vegas, super funny, and a romantic at heart. I never would have thought that a divorce attorney would be so freaking romantic. After everything that she's seen and everything that she's personally experienced, she still has room in her heart for the one, or maybe not the one, but a one who she can have a very long, you know, happy relationship with. And so when I was talking to her a little bit about my heartbreak at the time and the woes, she said, you know what? You just haven't found the right guy yet. And it was so cute. I just wanted to go over there and like freaking kiss her on the head because I'm like, you're adorable that you're a divorce attorney and you, you were dating a rock star for forever and he was so insecure and she just still believes in love. I mean, it was mind-boggling to me, truly. Again, I was prejudging or anticipating what it is that her perspective might be. And I love this because I love being proved wrong when I have these like, oh, I think this might be where the story will go because then I learn. I learn something. So we talked a lot about the different statistics and why relationships fall apart and like that five, seven-year itch thing and maybe why that kind of um, situation happens. She was saying that heterosexual relationships obviously have 
ridiculously dismal success rates for marriages. They're like less than 50%. But gay marriages are like way, way better. It's fantastic. I mean, maybe, Jay, we all need to just be gay. Would we be happier? It's a possibility based on the numbers, right? Just statistically speaking, maybe we all need to be gay so our relationships will last longer. I think that's so horrible. I'm going to get so much bad feedback for that. I'm totally joking, you guys. Um, I envy that statistic. I want to be a part of it. That's what I'm saying here. <laughs> I just want to be a part of a healthy statistic for a change, right? <laughs> so kudos to the community. Maybe I need to get some uh, other guests on here in the LBGTQ community to share their successes and how they make it work because maybe we all need to learn some lessons since they have those amazing success rates. We also talked with Mandy a little bit about how to be more discerning and to take it slow in a relationship. And that was something that I didn't do. <laughs> I mean, when I met my ex-husband, we were together for 14 years. Literally, we met and we talked on the phone for six weeks, didn't have our first date. And then after our first date, we basically spent the weekend together. And then that was it. It was like, it was forever. So that six weeks of just courting and talking, we did spend a lot of time getting to know each other. So when the fireworks hit, it was like, okay, we're here. We get it. But that's not how it works anymore because that was forever ago. And also in Canada, which Canadian people are just a tad bit different than Americans <laughs> or a lot different than Americans. And um, – I'm just older and I'm wiser and I look for different things and I'm more specific. It's not just about, hey, it's a good time and, you know, we talk in our pajamas and whatever. It's like real stuff, you know, real things that we we need to be thinking about at my tender age. <clears throat> we um, also talked about the importance of having other friends, right? When you're single and you're kind of navigating, you want to make sure that you're healing and fully healed before you enter into your next relationship. And she actually talked about her group of gay friends and how she gets the benefit of her her male energy while also having fun. So she kind of gets a little bit of that when she's in between relationships. So that's very beautiful. It's weird. I don't – I've never had a gay friend before. I don't know why. Hmm. She recommended having some really good gay friends to hang out with just because it's a really nice balance. So maybe I'll take that suggestion from her. Maybe I need to call Mandy up and just say, hey, take me out with you and your, your group. Um, so she was wonderful. I appreciated also that she said the best way to protect yourself from being extra hurt in a marriage if someone decides to get married is a prenuptial agreement. Obviously, makes sense. Not everybody does it, but that's the mo the best way to protect yourself to decrease the dis ease and the uncomfortable, awful feelings of a marriage ending. She did rec recommend just staying outside the box, not getting in the box. So it was funny because we had Mandy saying, "Get in the marriage box," or that's what she she helps women do is get inside the marriage box. Jamie Lynn was kind of like focus on long-term relationship, making sure that you find a man that has integrity and is stable and, um, you know, emotionally vulnerable, right? doesn't matter about the labels. But Mandy really did advocate for staying outside the marriage box. Like, just don't do it. <laughs> like, don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> don't get married, kids. Um, but still find someone and have a relationship with and make up your own rules of how your relationship works but definitely she was a supporter of the one-on-one -on -one thing. And that's great. So most of the women were suggesting that that's ideal. And supposedly the men want that too in the end. So very, very cool. We had then Ro, Ro Clausen. Ro Clausen, I had her on season one on my show. Amazing woman. I love her. I go for coffee with her. She married a man that she met in prison who was sentenced to, I think, 213 or 214 years in prison. And after 20 years, he was in there. So I think she met him about 10 years in. She fell for this guy. And I, was, I wanted to bring her back on the show for her to talk to us about how she was able to be discerning. Because there are people like I <laughs> that 
couldn't even discern a guy who's here in front of me that I could interact with and go see that he wasn't someone who was an avoidant, someone who had a avoidant attachment style who feared intimacy, total, in, you know, did all the things at the beginning, right? The love, the, you know, move in, here's the key, all the things, and all of a sudden the coin flips or the light switch goes, and then it's like the pullback. So how could she know that he was legit and she, he wasn't just manipulating her or saying the right things? And she, one of the things that was really important is that she heard when she would go and visit him, other people around that were visiting their inmate family members or friends or loved ones, she was hearing that they were all saying very, very amazing things about Adam, her now husband, that he was so supportive and helpful and he was training other people and those sorts of things in there and helping them with their cases. So having that outside support to validate and vouch for what that person is saying to kind of in a way, I don't want to say cross-check, she didn't say cross-check, but she just had that extra validation was very reassuring for her. But also, the way he spoke and he was dedicated to his helping of other people and helping himself and the way he spoke about his personal development and depth and his commitment and, and, his, and his follow through, he never wavered. And he was always willing to make sure that she, didn't, she wasn't tied to him. You know, she, he would say, I don't have any claim to you. You know, you don't have to do this. This is too difficult. I, I'm okay. Like, I let you go. He was never demanding, never expected, never took anything from her. And the other thing that was very important is that she wanted to, she didn't want to go to, she wasn't exercising in the gym. She was losing a lot of weight and all these kinds of things. And she needed to, like, take care of herself. And he encouraged her to go to the gym. And... She's like, yeah, 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 I should call, I should call. And then she ended up getting a call from one of the owners of the gym saying, hey, why don't you come back to the gym, whatever. Adam somehow from prison connected with the guy and had him call her to get her back. That is fucking amazing. Like how romantic is that? But also how meaningful is that? That he could only do so much, but from prison he called the guy who owns the gym and got the woman that he loved to start exercising. Huge, huge demonstration of his character. So those were all amazing. Now, I did have to make a disclaimer at the very beginning and at the end of the podcast, as well as what I'm doing now. This was not to and should not be taken to encourage anyone to start a relationship with an inmate, okay? Roe does not recommend it. I do not recommend it. Nobody recommends this, okay? So please don't go and, oh, I want an inmate. <laughs> he's going to be so amazing and he's going to do these sweet things. No, please don't. That is not the point. The point was to, in her very unusual circumstances where he couldn't demonstrate through actions, you know, really, or minimal actions, how do you discern? Because it was fascinating to me. Guys talk a lot. Women talk a lot too. I'm not bashing men, but guys can say a lot and then they have no follow through. I was very fascinated. How could this guy, how could she discern this guy that he's not just talking and there, how can you back up the action? Well, she gave some amazing uh, examples like I shared with you to demonstrate his true character. And since they've been married and he's out now and they have a boy it is even better than she could have imagined. They're so madly in love. When I see them here together, it's so cute. And people in the podcast studio, they're like, when they fight, they're even adorable. Like they don't even fight. They're just like, you know, it's like a little, like the cats that don't have the paw, you know, the claws, they're just like batting at each other in the air, right? Like, meow. it's super, super adorable. So learned so much from her and she's so humble but also feisty because she's from Jersey. So really cool episode. If you guys haven't watched that one, definitely check that out. Check all of them out, obviously. But Ro was really her – it was very cool just to hear her journey and some of the trials and tribulations, too, of her journey. You know, he wasn't going to get out, and then he was going to get out, and what was she going to do if he couldn't – if he wasn't going to be there, if he's going to be in there forever. I mean, there was a lot of psychological bullshit she had to go through and work herself through and, and doubt – 
So you might have a good relatability with her story if you're in a very unique or challenged situation where things might feel hopeless, but your heart is telling you, watch that episode because it's very inspiring and might give you some insights how to navigate your particular situation if it's one of those unique situations, unique relationships. All right, then we had Bishop Richard. So we started diving into the more spiritual aspect of relationships. And I wanted to ask Richard, Brother Richard, um, what the spiritual purpose of relationships are, why we have such a turnover in relationships. What does it mean? What's the implication? Again, talked about monogamy, polyamory, or, you know, whatever, poly, all the things related to love, sex, and relationships. And it was fascinating because he basically was saying that, you know, there is an energy exchange that happens between two people and they are intimate, which is true. This is physics. It's not even just like spiritual. He did explain that when two people come into an interaction together, and I loved when he said this, sex is the lure to keep people learning their lessons. I mean, when he said that, I'm like, it's so obvious, but it was so profound. I'm like, well, duh. I mean, sex is a, it's a pleasure. We don't have physical bodies wherever we came from, the stars of ethers, whatever. I mean, we're here to enjoy all the pleasure and all the physical experiences. And relationships, let's face it, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, they're not fun. They're meant to learn lessons, to learn more about coming into who we are, figuring out who we are, becoming higher versions of ourselves, a better expression of ourselves. And we're not going to, we're dumb. Humans are dumb in a way. We, We don't learn until things get really difficult. Rarely do we say, now there's a handful of us or more out there that will take challenges and will step out because we really want something bravely and even courageously because it's just we want it and we're so passionate it doesn't matter. But most of us don't want to do things. We wait until the last second and things get very, very difficult, painful, where finally taking a painful action is just less painful than what we're experiencing. So sex, from a spiritual perspective or a higher perspective of the the meaning and significance, allows us and encourages us to continue engaging with a person until our interaction is complete. Brilliant. Makes sense. 100% agree with that. So for him, he also had suggested that the reason why we're seeing more divorce rates or relationships not lasting as long is because we've evolved so much as a species in our mind, in our intention, our ability to create and we are accelerating our life lessons fast. So what might have taken our grandparents a whole lifetime or two, if you believe in that, to learn a lesson with a partner, it takes us a very short period of time. And so it could be months, it could be a year, it could be a handful of years to learn and then move on. And it's complete. And he said a very, very amazing thing. He said, The one thing he wants to caution people on is when relationship ends, to not believe that it failed. And that was another profound thing for me to realize as well, because in my situation, again, I didn't understand what what I did and I didn't do anything wrong. But I didn't really see it as a failure, but at the same time, there's part of me like, did he do something wrong? Did I do something like... How did we fail? What could we have done differently? What could the my partner have done differently? And there was nothing necessarily. Yes, we have free will choice. He had choice to run or to stay and work on it or whatever, but it came to a completion and we learned what we needed to learn and, and we move on and it's just complete. There was no failure. And that's really great too because it allows people to take the guilt, the shame, the blame, the I did something wrong, he did something wrong. What did we do wrong? I need to fix myself. We don't always need to be fixed. We can just allow it to be complete and take what we need from it and move on. And how much nicer does that feel? I know that felt brilliant for me to just realize that, and okay. 
you know, we don't have to hang on to it and make it feel bad or anything. So that was very valuable. He did talk a little bit about soulmates and twin flames a little bit in his own journey and how, again, free will choice when you have someone who is connected to you in a deep way that they kind of run away and they don't live they don't live out a choice that we expect or that we want. But with my next guest, Michelle Robinson, she was talking about the importance of learning from the twin flame journey that sometimes you need to let go and it's one twin can be the catalyst for the other twin to reach their highest potential. That's the greatest act of love for one twin to sacrifice themselves to not rating, reaching their greatest so that the other person becomes a lone wolf in a way and reaches their highest potential because when you don't have your greatest love, what, il- what else is there? You're free. When you've experienced the greatest love and that person chooses to not be with you, if you so then choose, you can live the most expanded, highest perspective, the highest expression of yourself. So instead of seeing a twin running away and contracting and not being with you, realizing at a soul level they are giving you the greatest gift and they've chosen to allow you to make the choice to live greater than you could have if you united physically with that person. That's almost more romantic than anything else. I mean, the ultimate sacrifice someone sacrificing their life, choosing to play small so that the other one chooses to be big. It's almost like, God, it just reminded me right now of that movie, Jay, what's the movie with uh, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga? You don't know. Um, Everyone else knows it was a remake. Um, Not Morning Star, Rising Star. The one where he... He kills himself. You know, he sees that she's playing small. She could be the biggest singer in the entire world, which she was. Stars born, thank you. Stars born. Like, I fucking cried my eyes out. That's the ultimate, in a way, the ultimate sacrifice. You know, he played small. He died. He killed himself, which was very traumatic. He had mental illness, so, like, it's a little dramatic. Okay, not this is not analogous. But he knew she loved him so much that she was going to play small for him. And he didn't feel deserving. Now that was the the problem with his situation. He didn't want to rise up and be with her and walk with her. But because he knew he didn't have the capacity, he stepped back and allowed her to be her greatest. I mean, whoa, you know? So Michelle was saying the same thing. Some twins particularly males who have a hard time, the masculine energy who have a hard time with the intimacy and have a hard time with um, their own enoughness and fears maybe that their person is going to leave them, their feminine um, twin is going to leave them, that they just play small at the conscious level, but perhaps at a spiritual level, it's all coordinated so that the divine feminine in this time of a great awakening can really make a major impact and live her highest. Wow, it's like, it's super romantic. But besides the romantic aspect of it, it's rang true to me and is particularly to my situation and gave me a lot of closure, a lot of extra closure that I had. Actually, that episode, it was the first time I went on record talking about my twin flame experience. There's a lot of things that you all are learning about me and my inner world and experience, but I did legit have one. um, I went through a lot with this whole, these labels, right? These spiritual labels. And it was all part of my process of coming to this point, right? Now it doesn't matter. Labels, soulmate, twin flame, karmic flame, whatever, care bear flame. (laughs) I don't know. All the things that people use out there, they don't mean anything anymore to me because I've gone through that process and I've resolved them. And now I'm like, I'm free to just create and have the relationships that focus on me accelerating my purpose and my experience of life. So I've kind of 
grown past the quote unquote twin flame journey because I've been released. I've learned what I need to learn at least from this stage of it so that I can experience all the amazingness and kind of surrendered to this separation and likely completion of our interaction because it was a very intense and very accelerated interaction. I feel like I lived lifetimes with um, the person that I had considered at that time my twin. So very amazing place to be on the other side of all of these relationship experiences that I've had, the marriage, the soulmates, the karmic twin flame, the regular twin flame, the relationship with myself, arriving at this place of complete wholeness and sovereignty. And I love every single one of the interactions I've had with the men in my life. I may not have loved them on a conscious level, but I can appreciate them and have love in my heart and, and gratitude because each one of them I learned something from. And like I said, arriving at this place where I'm whole and I can co-create individually, but also interdependently when I find somebody that will be the person that I can really complement my life and create, whether that ends up being one person or multiple people at different times of my life, um, cycling, knowing it's okay that some people may come in and out of my life. It's very liberating. It was not easy for me to arrive at this place, um, but it is possible for all of you out there that are at that, that place where you're struggling, particularly if you're in this spiritual entanglement of um, a relationship and a spiritually entangled relationship. I trust me. I know how fucking hard it is. I know. Oh, do I know years and years and years and years of these cycles to finally surrender and let go. But it's possible. I've done it. I'm on the other side of it. And you can too. So just keep doing your inner, inner work, surrender, love yourself, forgive yourself, forgive your twin or whoever, you know, your counterpart, any anyone, anyone you have a relationship with has a spiritual com component. And really, it comes full circle, you guys. I did this podcast to help people with their self-mastery journey and giving you practical, efficient, effective tools and strategies to be able to master your life right? Like the life hacks and all the different things. And it's funny because our relationships, like I said, are meant to teach us more about who we are, to reach another level, to illuminate our bullshit, and then we have to heal it and fix it or whatever. And then there's completion in that. And so here I am, having gone through all of my relationship experiences gone through the most epic of all supposedly relationships with Twin Flame and truly evolved back to myself. And this is the whole point. These relationships are meant for us to come into our wholeness and find out who we are so we can live freely how we want to with another person or not, truly passionately inspired, not needing, wanting, or desiring anyone else but should they be a compliment to you, it's a beautiful bonus and it's magic. So here we are, that these relationships outside of us are an integral and important part of our self-mastery. Who would have thought, right? It was an amazing series. I hope you guys check it out. Find which one resonates with you or watch all of them. Each guest has some amazing nuggets of information that I think you guys will adore. I know I did. I feel so much more solid in who I am and how I'm going to be navigating my relationship, not just with other people, but with myself on a whole new level at the next level. Level complete. Check mark. On to the next one. So we will be surprised. I will surprise you with my next episode. I might do another mini series. I will keep you guys posted. But until next time, I'm sending you so much love, so much gratitude, so much support on your self-mastery journey. Until next time.